Amen. Good morning. It is great to see you this morning. What a great way to start off the year. First Sunday of the year, you are batting 100% for attendance this year. Did you know that? And you know what's more? Is you're the only ones that can get 100% this year. Because everybody who's not here, they missed out on, the, on starting out. Start out strong and hold firm. That's what I tell the kids when they start school, you know. I, I, I told one of our kids last week, I said, you know, you're getting ready to start school next week, and you've got an A in every class. She looked at me like, what are you talking about? I don't get A's in every class. I said, but you've got an A in every class right now. All you have to do is keep them. It's good to see you. If you're a guest with us this morning, we're glad that you're here. We look forward to getting to know you better, and I uh, hope you feel welcome and a part of what's going on. You should have been given a bulletin when you came in the door. Inside that are upcoming announcements and activities you'll want to be aware of. I do want to draw your attention to one right now, uh, so you can... Uh, fill it out and place it in the offering plate if you would want to be a part of it. And that is uh, the Financial Peace University. We are starting a class coming up on January 22nd. Uh, let me guarantee you, if, uh, if you want to get a hold of your finances this new year and get a good grip on those, this would be a great opportunity for you. Uh, so take a look at that. It's the blue sheet in your bulletin. Take a minute, read that over. Uh, we would love for you to be a part of that class, but it starts January 22nd, coming up quick. So we just need to know how many uh, workbooks to order. Um, and uh, let me just say this. If, if, uh, if the uh, cost of the workbook is prohibitive for you, get in touch with me. Let's see what we can do. Because if... if uh, if you want to get a hold of your finances and get a good, solid foundation, uh, this is the way to do it. And so we want you to be a part of that. So uh, you can fill that form out if you would. Place it in the offering plate a little bit later in the service, and uh, we'll get you marked down for that class. Also, you'll notice the connection card attached to your bulletin, as every week. If, uh, if there's things going on that uh, you'd like some information about, you can mark that on that card. If you're a guest with us, we ask if you would, just take a minute, fill that card out, let us know you're here this morning. And if you'll place that in the offering plate as well, we will have access to that. You'll notice on the back there is prayer requests. If there's anything going on in your life or your family's life that we can be praying about, we'd encourage you to share that with us. Uh, this evening, we have an evening worship service in the chapel starting at 6 o'clock. encourage you to come and join us for a great time of worship there. But uh, we will use part of that time to specifically pray for every single one of your requests that have been turned in. And so uh, take a minute, jot down what's going on in your life or some friends' lives that we can be praying about, and we'll make sure to lift those requests to the Lord. Let me open us in a word of prayer now, and we'll get started with our worship service. Father God, as we come before you today, we are so grateful and thankful for the opportunity we have to gather together in worship, to celebrate you, to celebrate who you are, to celebrate your love for us, the grace and the mercy that you offer us. Lord, right now, we pray that you would receive our praise and our worship as we lift our voices to you, as we praise you for who you are. Receive our praise as an offering today. And Lord, help us to keep our eyes focused on You. Life offers us many distractions. There are many things happening that are concerning to us and, and sometimes can consume us. But right now, for each and every one of us, I pray, Lord, that You would just help us to put those distractions aside right now. In this time of worship, may our eyes be focused on You the love that you have for each one of us. Bless us. Find us faithful in our worship now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mike? We stand and sing together.
you see this? I'm reading from Romans chapter 5, verse 20 and following. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Did you hear that? Where sin increased, grace increased all the more. We serve a God who is very merciful and also very gracious, always giving his grace to us. Let's sing about that amazing grace. We found a, a earring, so if you lost it, we've got it. Let's pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for a wonderful day, a great place to come and worship you, dear Lord. And we just pray that the money that we collect, dear Lord, that will just go to better help serve you, dear Lord, 
we lift up our families, dear Lord, and the message that the pastor is going to bring to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together a song called, Lord, I Need You. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without And where you
Christ in me. Yes, where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Every time you need you, my one defense, my righteousness, Lord, God, how I need you. Teach my soul. this morning would you come proclaiming father that we do need you that you are god and that we come before you with all we are desiring to have a closer relationship with you father and i pray that this morning you would work in and through our pastor father to to bring us a special message we need to hear this morning father and that you would draw us close to yourself in jesus name amen amen Diversity has been as part of, of creation since the beginning. I mean, think about it. When, when God created the heavens and the earth, think about the details that went into that from His perspective. All that, that He had to consider. The variety of animals, the variety of plants. Diversity has been a part of creation from the beginning. And we, as, as a nation represent that well from the beginning this nation has been a diverse nation made up of all different kinds of people all different types of people all different types of environment and and terrain you think about the the songs we used to sing when we were children of america the beautiful from, from sea to shining sea, from the coasts to, to the mountains, the majesty of the Rockies. And, and, and as, as majestic as the Rockies are, try and go out to the West Coast, especially the Pacific Northwest, and, and see the glacier-capped mountains standing majestically, rising up from, from the sea level and from the rainforests and from the desert areas and the plains. The diversity has been a part of who we are from the beginning. Yet our diverse nation has developed into a division in which judgment of differences has all but destroyed the sense of unity upon which this nation was able 
to establish one common union from 13 different and unique states. The development of individuality and the freedom of creation of knowledge gave way to the necessity of acceptance of varied beliefs just in order to sustain some type of unity. We went through a period of time where though we knew it may be wrong, we allowed people to have their own ideas and beliefs. And we didn't question. We didn't address. For the cause of unity, we said, let's just all get along. And yet, in this day, we have found that it has pushed beyond unity into division itself and rejection of truth in the name of tolerance and acceptance we now reject the idea of unity through shared beliefs we have come to a point where we have lost our way We have gotten to a point where we are no longer a unified people as a nation, but a very, very divided people as a nation. So much so that you see it in today's society. You see it in the news every day. Division so hateful. That what we may have agreed upon several years ago, we now must fight against because the other side likes that idea now. Isn't it interesting how the issues are not about issues anymore, but about who likes the issue? No longer are we looking at what is best and what is true and what is right and what is just. We're looking at who we like and who we don't like, and we're standing against whatever they stand for. We have lost all sense of unity. And my fear is that if we're not careful, that can infiltrate the church as well. You say, surely not, Pastor. We believe in one God, one Lord, and one Savior. That unifies us together. Yes, I realize that, but I have watched, even within my short lifetime, I have watched as society's problems have infiltrated the church time and time again. And so this morning, I want to remind you and I, and this is as much for me as for you, but I want to remind us that we have not been called to release our convictions for the benefit of peace and unity. That is not where unity comes from. That is not where peace comes from. You know, I lived in Gunnison for eight years in the heart of Colorado, in the heart of the Rocky Mountains. It's a little bit different out there. It's a nice place to visit, and if you visited there, you've gotten a taste of God's wonderful creation, but you really don't, unless you spend a little bit of lengthy time there, you really don't get the full impact of the people that migrate there. You see, those are the people that every week, one day a week, every week at lunchtime, and and Gunnison is no bigger than Richmond. Population-wise, it's about the same size. But but every week, you, you go by Main Street, and on one corner there, on Main Street, right in the middle of town, you will find several people standing there with their signs Peace, not war. Great idea. There's only one problem with that. It doesn't exist. It can't happen apart from Christ. You see, if we just become apathetic and appease everyone, 
then you're overrun and you still have war. You fight for what is true and what is right. You know, one of, one of, uh, one of the boy's favorite historical figures um, was, and now he just vacated my mind. There I go. It's a brand new year. Starting off good. Um, um, grew up in the hills of Tennessee. Yes, Alvin York, thank you. Whoo! Senior moment. One of their favorite figures is Alvin York, and, and Alvin York had to wrestle with this idea. A fairly new Christian at the time, he was drafted. And he said, I don't believe in killing. It's wrong. I'm not going to go fight in the war. But you know, one of the discussions that, that it is, it is uh, indicated that he had along the way was, was he was asked, if, if someone broke into your home and threatened your wife and your children, would you take action? Or would you just say, peace at all cost and sacrifice your whole, own family? You see, the reality is Unity does not come simple and easy. It takes work. The founders of this nation worked hard to bring 13 diverse states and governments together to create one. This new year, I want us to set our sights and our hearts to true unity, which can only take place through our Lord Jesus Christ. And with that in mind, I'd like you to open your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Ephesians, a letter that Paul wrote, Ephesians chapter 4. Because this morning we're going to talk about walking a balanced life, and it's not an easy thing, especially when, when we read what we read this morning, because it's going to be a diff difficult conflict within ourselves as we hear what the Word of God tells us. We're in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning with verse 1, if you'll follow along as I read. <clears throat> Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. I want, to, I want to stop there for a minute. And I want to start with what, what he's written to this point. I want you to hear a couple of key things. But the challenge is they're, they're going to be difficult to put together. The first one is this. He calls us to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. Your calling. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you were called to be a part of the family of God. What does that look like? Well, he gives a list here. He gives a list here of what that should look like, of how we should walk. We should be humble. Now, humble does not necessarily always mean meek. It does not mean someone who hides. It means to be humble is to do what you were called to do without needing all of the recognition, all of the, the back padding, all of the recognition of, of, oh, you did a great job, of just do what you're called to do without concern of that recognition, without concern of people coming up and encouraging you for doing it. That's, that's what being humble is about. 
You see, one of the things that I learned early on is, especially as a pastor, but as a church planter, I can't grow a church. I don't have the ability to do that. And let me just, let me just say this for, for far off, younger crowd only needs to, to hear this, but for far off distant uh, necessities, when the time comes that, that you're looking for, for a new pastor, that's not anytime soon, don't, don't get any ideas, I'm not going anywhere. Um, but, but the reality of, of it is this. There is no pastor that's going to be able to grow a church. There are individuals out there who can draw a crowd. But a lot of people can draw a crowd. I mean, think about it. Across this nation, losing NFL teams can draw a crowd. Losing Major League Baseball teams can draw a crowd. That's not what a church is. God's the only one that can grow a church. Now, He may use me in the process. He may use you in the process. But it's God who grows the church. Humility is, is recognizing those type of things. Though I am called to do things, though you are called to do things, it's God who works through them. It's not about how great I am or how great you are. It's about how great God is. But walking in a manner worthy of the calling also means that you're gentle. You know, we went, we went through a period of time as the church in America back in the 60s. And some of you were, were here. Some of you were a part of some of these churches. And it, it, wasn't that, it wasn't that we were arrogant or anything else, but a lot of times we, we took this approach, and some of you enjoyed it. You know, some of you get excited when, when I come across that this, this way from time to time. Not that I do that often, but, but we come across rather aggressive from the pulpit. You, you, you've surely read about it if you haven't experienced it, of standing, those pastors standing behind the pulpit, thumping the pulpit and shaking their Bible and yelling and screaming at, and, and, and you need to turn from your sin and you need to get your life right and you need to... And it was a lot of yelling and attacking. And I'm not saying that God didn't use that in a, in a period of time, but, but we're meant to be gentle as well. And what goes along with that is the next one that he mentions, and that is patient. That's not easy. It's not easy to be patient. And, and some of you, you'll pray for patience sometimes. Be careful when you pray for patience. I, you need it. And I don't, I don't dissuade you from praying for patience, but just be ready. Because when God grants patience, it's through trials and tribulations. That's how you gain patience. You know, it, it, patience isn't, isn't one of the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit that's listed in the Bible as, as he, he grants patience. Patience is learned by experience. But we need to be patient. Walking according to our calling means we're patient. It also means we're tolerant. Now that word has been hijacked along with a lot of other things that have been hijacked by the world. Tolerant does not mean that we tolerate whatever people do. Tolerant means we recognize that the decision is yours. You know, many of you are parents. And you have learned that you have trained your children up. And when they were young, you could control and force them to act accordingly. There were punishments that you could inflict. There, there were uh, rewards that you could offer. And you could control the actions of your children. But as they grew, they had to begin taking responsibility, didn't they? That's part of parenting. 
is, is to encourage our children to be able to take responsibilities and make decisions for themselves. And sometimes I have to tolerate a wrong decision on my son's part in order for him to learn what he needs to learn. But in, in the society we live in, in the, in the picture that God has given us of Christianity, the reality is we have to tolerate others' decisions. We don't have to tolerate their actions. But they have a choice of what they're going to do with Jesus. Everyone does. You did. You had a choice of what you were going to do when you learned about who Jesus was. That He was the one and only Son of God. That God loved you so much that He sent His Son to live on earth as a man because of you. He loved you so much that He allowed Him to live here and endure the challenges of being a man and the, the, the temptation, but He overcame the temptation and never sinned. He loved you so much that He allowed His Son to go to the cross, shed His blood and die on that cross to pay for your sin. Now that is all true. He was buried in a tomb. He conquered death and is alive and at the right hand of God the Father, preparing a place for you and I if we so choose to accept what He did for us. But there is where the tolerance has to come in, folks. I cannot force you any more than I could force my children to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. All I can do is give you the information and then I have to tolerate your answer. And if you choose to reject it, I have to tolerate that. I can't forcibly change it. It doesn't work that way. But I do not have to tolerate calling what is wrong and evil good. I don't tolerate that. We as a nation have done a lot of things in our breaking up of unity that has brought us to the point where we have accepted things as right when they are wrong. Life is precious to God. And anyone who takes a life is wrong. I do not tolerate by saying it's okay. That includes every aspect of that from conception to death in between that time God has given us life and I don't tolerate an answer of well it's it's justified but I tolerate your choice as to how you will choose to live that's part of the calling that we have been given and then the last part of, of walking in a manner worthy of the calling is to be diligent to preserve unity. And there's where the kicker comes in for us. How do we preserve unity? How are we diligent in preserving unity? And to start, we've got to ask the question, what is unity? What is unity? And for our purpose this morning, I put a phrase up here. A phrase that you should be familiar with. A phrase that came out of the foundation of this nation. It's a Latin phrase. E pluribus unum. Out of many, one. Well, what does that have to do with unity? Unity is not. Unity is not. All of us being the same. Unity comes in the midst of diversity. I know that doesn't sound right, but it is. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. And yet, look around. You see, we are a body of Christ here. 
at First Baptist Church. We are a body of Christ. How many of us are just alike? Not many. Because a lot of you I know, and you are one of a kind. But so am I. We're all one of a kind. In fact, Paul goes on to remind the people here of how we all have different callings. But here's, here's part of the balance here. When it says one God and Father, then there are some qualifiers that go along with that. It says of all, over all, through all, and in all. See the commonality here? The word all? That's where the unity comes from. It's not from us all being the same. It's that all of us are together. We're all brought in together as part of the family. So, how is it that these two dynamics, walking in a manner worthy of the calling, and yet preserving unity, how do those two work together? Because sometimes I struggle with that. I walk out into our community. And I interact with different people. And some of them I just have to shake my head at. And I think, how in the world did you get there? How did we as a nation get to where we are today? Where we don't even look at the issue, we look at who's bringing the issue up and we make a decision based on that. If you're for it, then I'm against it. How ridiculous is that? And yet that's where we are. We have gotten to the place where we allow people to make our decisions because of whether we like them or not. Form our opinions based on that. How can these two dynamics work together in our lives? How do we walk as He calls us and yet recognize unity as He has defined unity? Paul says it. It's only by grace. Only by grace and by being who God has called us to be. Let's continue reading here in verse 7. It says, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, When He ascended on high, He led captive a host of captives, and He gave gifts to men. Now this expression, He ascended, what does it mean except that He had descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is Himself also He who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. <clears throat> and he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by the craftiness in the deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together, by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. All the parts work together. Now, you, you experience this every single day of your life. You experienced it this morning from the time that your alarm went off to the time you got ready to come to church to the time you got in your car and drove here or rode here, uh, however it was you got here, to you walking through the door. 
The simplest of things that you experienced this day was a unity of differing things. You walked through the back door. How did that happen? How many different parts are in that simple little door back there? But every single part was necessary for you to get inside this building. How many different parts are in that car that you got in and simply turned a key and pushed a gas pedal and a brake pedal and used a steering wheel to get here? And yet how many different little tiny parts were necessitated to be working just right in order for you to get here? Any one of those little things, just one little gear in that car, if it would have gone out this morning, would have changed your whole day. You know, I started out this morning congratulating you. The first Sunday of the year and you're here. Your attendance is 100%. I'm not keeping attendance. That, that's really not what I need to focus on. But you know what? When you're not here, we're not complete. This is a body. And every part of this body is important. But folks, please hear this. Right now, we don't need another pastor. I hope. Right now, we, we, we don't need to replace you. Each and every one of us here has unique gifts, unique abilities, unique callings to walk as God has called us to walk. And together, we make a unified body that is complete and full. You are a part of that, a necessary part of that. Some of you are getting to the point where you think you're really not necessary. Shame on you. Shame on you. You're a part of this family and you are a necessary part. And when you're not here, we're not complete. Unity comes with diversity. If we were all the same, it'd be a pretty boring gathering. Yet because we are different, because God has made us each unique, together, we become something so much greater than any of us individually can ever be. All the parts working together for one purpose. Now, where does that unity go? And I want, you to, I want to take you back to the qualifiers that Paul put when he said, One God and Father. Of all, over all, through all, and in all. All. I want you to look around you right now. There's some space. Some empty space. There's some pew cushions that aren't being used right now. I, I think on this lower level, let me, let me glance around here, I think I'm pretty confident. On this lower level, there, there's actually only one pew. Everybody's afraid to sit in it. You know, the front. Let me just say, I can't spit that far, so you're free to sit there anytime you want to. There are some spaces around you. You know what? There are more people. There are more of the all that are out there than are in here. That's their choice. But some of them haven't been given all the information to make a good choice. And I wonder if that neighbor of yours, if that family member of yours, if that good friend of yours, if that co-worker of yours who doesn't have a church home, 
I wonder if they've been given enough information to make a good decision. I wonder if the plans that God has for them will impact the plans God has for you and I. You ever wonder about that? You ever wonder about as, as the maker is putting together his, his creation and, and whether that be a car or a watch or a... It, it, let's take the watchmaker for a minute who's putting together a watch and he needs one more gear that's over on that bench over there. But that gear really doesn't realize that it's needed at all. And so it's gone into hiding. It's comfortable right where it's at. Doesn't think it has a need. And yet here we are, the watch, almost ready to do amazing things. And yet we're not quite complete yet. Because there's parts that haven't been brought into the whole, the body. Let me just say this, if, if, if you're a guest this morning, or maybe you've been coming here for a little while, let me just say that my conviction is if you're here, then God brought you here for a reason. And you are what God is saying will help complete and fulfill us. Oh, we're going to strive to be all God has called us to be as a church family. But God wants to continue to build on us. Develop us a little bit more. Make us even more than what we are now. And those of you who are guests or, or off and on attenders... I believe God has you here for a reason. But folks, family, let me tell you this. There are some others. The reason there's a blank spot on the pew around you, God put that there because there's someone that you know that needs Him, that needs to be a part of what God's plans are. And you may be the one that's going to find that peace. You see, only through Christ can we walk the walk and talk the talk at the same time. And that's the balance that I see here in this passage that Paul is talking about. Walking the walk, walk in a manner worthy of the calling. But also talk the talk, speak the truth. It's not overly popular in our society today. Our truth is not overly popular. But you know what? God didn't call us to be popular. He called us to be faithful. Speak the truth. Speak it in love. Speak it with patience. Speak it humbly. Speak it gentle. Speak it with tolerance. But determine to preserve unity by speaking the truth. We are as a nation where we are today because too many of us have kept our mouths shut and kept truth to ourselves. Please hear this with all love and all respect. But the fact of the matter is, you and I, none of us are that important that God would entrust a truth to us that is just for our benefit that we don't need to share with anybody else. I'm not that important that God would say, this is for you, you don't need to share it with anybody else. The truths that we have experienced as followers of Christ need to be shared, need to be proclaimed, need to be held to, need to be pushed forward. And I believe that the revival that God has coming that will happen through you and I in this community, but through the church across this globe, that revival that is coming that God wants to entertain and bring about, 
I believe with all of my heart that that revival will bring truth back to this world. Truth that has been set aside for too many years. But it comes from us choosing to walk in a manner worthy of the calling that we have been given. And at the same time, speaking truth to bring about unity. Our actions of grace and of love must be accompanied by the one truth that we have found in Christ. Have you found that truth? Do you understand it? Do you know it? Are you spending time in His Word enough that the truth is evident? I'm asking each of us to consider this year becoming a little bit like well, like federal agents that inspect for counterfeit. I want you to know the Word of God so well that the counterfeit sticks out. That's how it works. They don't study counterfeit bills. They study the real thing. And they know it so well by the feel, by the smell, by the look, by, the, by every aspect of it, even by the sound of it. They know it so well that the counterfeit stands out. Do you know your faith so well that the counterfeit stands out? That's who I want us to be. And when we step up to that type of walk, then our talk will impact the world and will change it. And unity will be a reality again. I don't believe it's so far gone that it can't be retrieved. But it's going to require us. So this new year, church, who will we be? What difference will we make in the world that we live in? 2018 is over. It is gone. It is done. There is absolutely nothing you can do to change what happened in 2018. But you still got a whole lot of 2019 to go. What do you want it to look like at the end? It begins now. It begins with you and I. It's a choice that you're given that I'm given. How are you going to walk and how are you going to talk this new year? Let's pray together. Father God, Your Word is clear. Your truth is clear. And Your calling is clear. First and foremost, you have called each and every single one of us into a relationship with you through your Son. And I pray right now that the Spirit of God would mightily move through this place, through each and every heart and mind here, that we would know without a doubt when we leave this place that we are either for or against you. It's our decision to make but Lord, I pray that not one individual would leave this place today without knowing the decision they have made. Do they belong in the family of God through the blood of Jesus, through the forgiving power of the cross? Do they know that? Lord, help them to realize whether or not they have accepted that. And there are some right now Lord, You are calling out to them. Join the family. Receive the forgiveness. And experience the freedom from sin that it will no longer control You. I pray that You would give them courage and boldness to act upon that. But Lord, every single one of us in this place face decisions today of how we will walk, whether we will walk worthy of the calling that we have been given. Because Lord, You did not save us to sit. You saved us to act. Salvation is not an accomplishment. Salvation is a way to live. And it requires our action and our decision. 
And so help us today to determine this year to walk in a way worthy of the calling that we have been given. And then Lord, give us the courage to talk the talk. To speak the truth. To stand for what is right. Bring unity out of the diversity of who we are. And let it spread like wildfire throughout our community that you might be glorified in it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. It's the beginning of a new year. I'm not asking for New Year's resolutions. I'm asking you to decide who you are and who you're going to be. Doesn't matter what's happened in the past. That's irrelevant at this point. You can't change any of that. What you're going to do from this moment forward is all up to you. So what is God asking of you today? And what are you going to do with it? Will you stand? We're going to sing a hymn of invitation, an opportunity for you to step out and come and respond to what God has said to you. The altar is open if you'd like to come and pray. I will be here. A couple of our deacons will be here if you'd like to come and be a part of what God's doing here at First Baptist Church. Join this church family. We would love to have you fulfill God's call to make you a part of this body. Maybe you need to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior this morning. We'll answer any questions you have and help you to make that decision well. You step out and come as we sing. All to Jesus I surrender All to Him I freely Just two quick announcements this morning. Uh, this afternoon at 4 o'clock is a deacon's meeting, so that's happening at 4 today. And also tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. is our MLT meeting, so be aware of that. 
Don's going to come and lead us in a word of prayer as we close our service out. Let me encourage you, if you're here this morning and God has been working on you in some way, what the enemy wants most of all is to get you out the door. Before you turn to walk out that door, if God has been encouraging you to take an action, to make a decision, don't wait. Our deacons, they, they will be here and, and you can come up and talk with them or grab someone who's just seated right around you. Talk with, talk with somebody before you leave. Don't allow the enemy the victory this morning. Start the year off well. All right? Don, lead us in a word of prayer and then we'll sing as we close out our service. Our gracious Heavenly Father, as we pause right now, Lord, we've heard your word this morning that we need to turn it all over to you and then to allow you to put us in the place where you want us to be a part of that in this church body, Father. Help us to look to you and to allow you to use us because we can't do it ourselves. We can't even do it at all. We need you, Father, to, to do it. Lord, we thank you for this today. We thank you for your word. And I just pray that as you speak to each one of us, Father, that we will listen and be obedient to your word. For we do ask in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. One, one quick thing let me add. Uh, as we talked about this challenge of balancing these two ideas this morning, we're going to continue that idea this evening in a balance as we continue our study of the old stories. Tonight we'll be talking about Ruth and uh, an unusual balance there that we haven't ever, con most of us haven't really considered before. So six o'clock tonight in the chapel, we'll be talking about Ruth a little bit, going a little bit deeper into that story, and I encourage you to come and join us this evening. Mike? I love you. Have a great week.